I'll get it. Smash. Uh, <laughs> any initial questions on that? I thought that was pretty fast for eight minutes. Uh, so don't feel bad if you didn't take away every point from there. I got it. No. You got it. <laughs> Direct all questions to that man. <laughs> um, but we're going to go through it. Uh, I don't know where Taylor went, but Taylor and I are going to go through this again, highlight some different points. And yeah, by the way, my name is Alex. And um, I work for a Bitcoin company called BitGo, which is down in Palo Alto. And we write wallet software for exchanges and companies. And if anyone is interested in blockchain work, developers, front end, design, product management, anything, you should come talk to me after because we are hiring like mad. There are so many problems, not enough people. We need a lot of help. And it's really, really exciting. Like, really, really fun. So come talk to me after if that's your jam. It's always fun in here to take the take the pulse on uh, like who's used crypto before, etc. I know this is more of a dev focused thing, but it's always good to get the yeah. feel of the room. Yeah. So who who here has heard of Bitcoin before? <laughs> yes. Okay, if you haven't, that's actually great. Like, love to see new people here who have no idea. Um, really good place to just ask questions, feel comfortable approaching people. People are super nice. But most of you know about Bitcoin. That's cool. How many of you have heard of Lightning Network before? How many of you can explain why Lightning, what problems Lightning Network solves? Okay. How many of you own Bitcoin or some cryptocurrency? Yeah. And how many of you have run a cryptocurrency full node to Chainhead? Nice. Nice. <laughs> Okay, and how many of you understand Bitcoin script? How addresses work? Cool. Well, the idea is that at the end of this, you'll know all those things. So that's the dream. So let's try to do that. Okay. You want to come up or under? Cool. Okay. So um, that's my GitHub picture. You can come find me on GitHub. Uh, my plan is that if you take nothing away from this talk right here, that's actually OK. Because you can go to this GitHub site. You can go to my talks repository. And I'll put up all the slides and probably a YouTube video once that gets posted. And uh, there's so many resources that I've compiled for you that you can go and study on your own, um, which is pretty much what I did. Uh, so. That'll be up there. Uh, I'm, like I said, software engineer for BitGo, also a uh, digital nomad. I was born in Vermont, but I've been traveling around Southeast or South America, Central America, now in Canada for the past year. Um, and that's been really fun. So we can talk about that after as well, if you'd like. So here are the main goals that I want to accomplish with this talk. Um, I'm just a developer who is really interested in the low-level components, the protocols, how transactions are set up, um, and I want to share that with you. And I'm going to try to start at a high level and then work my way downwards where towards the end I may lose the majority of you, but I kind of want to put something for everyone, so uh, don't don't feel bad to like, if, if it's above your head, you can go and talk elsewhere or uh, whatever. You can, you can take what you want from this talk. So I'm going to start with one of those first questions I asked with what are the problems? You know, why do we even care about this? Tech is really cool, but if it doesn't solve any problems, it's a lot less useful. Um, uh, talk about like what Lightning solves right now in terms of media problems, and then new things that have never been done before that Lightning will let us do. Um, I'll go through for the developers who are interested, we'll go through and look at what actually interacting with the Lightning Network looks like. Um, Taylor is going to talk about Neutrino, which is this, what's called a light client for LND, uh, for Lightning. Um, to actually run a Lightning node is like, you need to be pretty much a developer and you need to 
have your own machine and hard drive space and all this thing, all these things, and it's just very messy. And Neutrino makes it much easier for just someone to like uh, run it on your desktop or maybe even your phone with slight variations. And then I'll put the references at the end for anyone who wants to do some future study of this. Okay, and I'll put a couple breaks in between so we can have some questions. Uh, if you have questions, keep them to like, I don't understand what you said, can you put some clarification? Rather than like, oh, I know this thing that's related to what you're talking about, let me talk about it because no, it's fine. that's cool, but <laughs> it's cool, but we will be here all day and uh, you can talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> all right. Sound good? Yeah. Yep. All right. So the first thing, why do we even care? So if you know about Bitcoin and you know about the segue, uh, the two megabyte hard fork segwit debate, uh, that got solved recently, thank God. But the main problem that was being talked about, and still a problem that Bitcoin has right now, is it is not scalable. The original goal was for with Satoshi was to have it be the world's internet cryptocurrency. We would be trading it, we would buy coffee with it, it would replace fiat currency. And while people may dream for that, it's really not going to be a reality anytime soon. And the easiest way to see this is to look at the relative uh, kind of bandwidth or like transactions per second is the metric that these various technologies can do. So for whatever reason, people are making Visa be like the dream, the goal of how many transactions a second we want to do. So I looked up some stats, and on average, they do Visa does 2,000 transactions per second. And during the holiday season, they can and they did a stress test where they ramped it up, and they could do 56,000 transactions per second. To put this in perspective, Bitcoin way over there currently on average does four transactions per second, and theoretically it could do seven, but that's like if you made the smallest transactions and you just weren't even using it in a, in a sane way, the theoretical max is seven. Uh, to put it in perspective, like just, I don't really wanna get into a political debate, but just, I think this is really relevant for the, the Bitcoin Cash discussion. Bitcoin Cash is this fork of Bitcoin, which is saying we need to scale Bitcoin and we can't use SegWit because it's complicated and it might introduce bugs. So let's just increase the number of transactions that you can put into a single block. And a block is just a collection of transactions that happen every 10 minutes in Bitcoin. And just like, this doesn't make sense to me because they doubled it and it took us two years to do that. And that's about the relative bandwidth transactions per second and they want to go from that to this and even if they want to go to this which is the hypothetical Bitcoin 50x where we have 50 megabyte blocks um, we're going to reach there are very this technical reasons that this would never ever work and um, there's centralization concerns and it's just not a scalable way to scale I think uh, so this is one of the problems that Lightning is trying to solve, is you cannot push transactions through this technology fast enough. Yes? Hey again, my this feed hole to write down this uh, 50 transaction, like uh, way, way more bigger than one. So it's not that much bigger, because you represent it's like much, much bigger. OK. You just intentionally show Bitcoin 50 is bigger than it should seem according to the series. Okay, I tried to make it like 10 times smaller than this. Because it's 200 to 2,000, but, wow, okay. okay. Quick question. Yes. So the concern about Bitcoin Cash approach is you'll never get the block big enough to accommodate all those transactions, never in the future, or? <clears throat> um, yeah, that's the problem. Is okay. that, I mean, so it's, there's like various bottlenecks in the technology. One of them is the block size. But there are other things like um, how many uh, ECDSA signature validations you can do per second. And the node really isn't, like a regular computer can't do that. And the idea is that anyone with a laptop or with a desktop in their, in their 
home can run the software and be their own bank. Okay. And if it comes to the point where only the banks can run the software, then what the hell's the point? Cool. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why, but Google is being weird. And let me try it one more time. This one, I've been Googling, and it's in the background. I just want to say Vitalik's been up in the, in September saying that the yes. Ethereum will have uh, diesel level yeah, scalability it, it by 2018. <laughs> It should be looking for Yeah, go for the down arrow, like this. Oh, God, what's happening? Oh, the internet's weird. Well, while the internet loads, we're just going to go this way, if that's okay with everyone. Everybody get off the network. <laughs> Stop buying crypto kitties, damn it. <laughs> um, so, another problem we have is that. Um, kind of related to the transactions per second, but there can only be one megabytes worth of transactions every 10 minutes. And right now, uh, there's something called the mempool, which is this collection of unconfirmed transactions which are waiting to be included in a block. And that mempool is anywhere from 30 to 60 to 100 times the actual number of, uh, the actual size of a single block. So there are probably transactions that are weeks old that are trying to get included in there. And normally you have to increase the fee for a transaction in order for it to be more, to, in order to incentivize a miner to include it. But um, there's so many transactions that want to happen and they just can't be put into the blockchain. Uh, so Lightning, again, is coming in here and allowing us, like that guy said in the eight minute talk before, to push those transactions off chain and still have them be secure but have them happen as fast as you can push electrons through a wire. May, may I butt in again? Because sure. this is actually, this is pretty brutal. This is really starting to affect not just, like it used to be up until very recently that you needed to include a high fee for your Bitcoin transaction for preferential handling. And we currently, we discovered today while we were hanging out here, like covering some of this curriculum, we have some outstanding uh, like sends and receives that we set purposefully low fees. You used to be able to put a $2, $1 fee on something even a month ago, and it would just take six days. Well, we have some outstanding transactions, like I'm waiting to get paid back for beer, and like I sent a friend 20 bucks or something. I sent a low, you know, low priority, but low priority is starting to actually look like no priority which we, we fear to this happening. It'll be about two Since months. If that happens, this isn't really at all a fair system anymore. It'll be about two months. I've had that happen before. I had, it took two months for one of my transactions to go through because my wallet miscalculated the, the fee that it needed to be accepted on the network. So it could be that. You used to be able to sneak it in there. Used to. So, <laughs> but we're going to fix this stuff. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, so once you put a transaction to the mempool, like let's say you put a really low fee and you're like, oh shit, it's never going to execute, can you cancel that? You can. There are There is a process that allows you to do it, but it depends on your particular software that you're using, mm -hmm. uh, whether they support it. So for instance, my company doesn't support mm -hmm. it. It's called Replace by Fee, and it lets you mark a transaction when you originally send it out and say, if a similar transaction with a different fee gets broadcasted, drop this one and put the and replace it with this new one with a higher fee. Mm -hmm. But like it's spottily implemented. You know, not everyone actually supports and it. That's a uh, you call it Bitcoin script or something like that. But my yeah. company or well no that they executes this like contract or whatever <coughs> that you're talking about. Uh, it's it's just a you want it of the protocol. Um, oh, right. like if you run the core software Bitcoin D, it will let you do that. There are there are other applications that let you out there too. I think there's like two or three Android wallets um, or Android specific software that lets you override your current transaction to beef up the fee. Um, the big thing is you do have to sacrifice and uh, put you trust that application with your private key of that of your said wallet that you're moving transactions out of. So does my ceiling? Here, let's let's talk about that yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. We can talk about that all day. <laughs> okay, yeah, how do we scale um, these blockchains? Because blockchains are not magic things. They're actually very expensive data processing when you're expecting the entire world 
to validate the transaction that's happening. Um, as soon as more people in the world or enough people care about it, suddenly you're going to have um, more people that want to get into this finite block size than it is. And you can raise the block size limit as much as you want, but you'll never get to the scalability um, that you actually need for a world payment system to exist. Um, so if we want that type of scalability, we need to take the payments off-chain, but we want to take them off-chain in a way that builds upon the good things that we like about Bitcoin. So um, it builds upon it in a way that is building on the scarcity of Bitcoin. Like we still um, know that all of the payments in the Lightning Channel are backed by real Bitcoin, um, and we can verify the supply curve of Bitcoin, and we can know that's good. Um, and we want it to be updatable, like just as in the blockchain, it's very hard to censor um, transactions. Um, we want payment channels that are uh, difficult to censor, or it's difficult for users in the payment channel to know what's happening or know who's being paid, so it's difficult for them to censor you. Um, and we want uh, this system to also push us towards better privacy. Um, the privacy model in Bitcoin is pseudonymous, and it has been pretty thoroughly broken. Um, but all of the relationships between the nodes in the Lightning Network are routed through an onion system of you only see what you need to know in order to participate in the transaction. So it's taking um, some of the weaknesses of Bitcoin and improving on it, and I think it's taking the core strengths of what Bitcoin is and improving on those strengths as well, or kind of building on them in a very good way. Um, and part of the uh, no censorship is no intermediaries. So you can go and create a lightning payment channel a connection with anyone else on the network who's running the same software. And you don't need to trust anyone else. So you don't need banks, um, which is another great Bitcoin thing that we want to keep going. Um, so conceptually, we're changing how we're thinking about um, the blockchain now, rather than the blockchain being that thing that processes transactions, that you're waiting for it to process the transactions when you're sending Bitcoin transactions, um, the blockchain becomes the arbitrator of the smart contracts that you have. Um, so you are now, instead of um, yeah, making traditional Bitcoin transactions on the blockchain, you are negotiating payment channel updates or the smart contract channel updates. Um, which can be done just between you and the person you are um, connected with. And no one else needs to know about that update. Um, and you can start to chain these contract updates together so that every node can pay every other node as long as you can find a path uh, with sufficient liquidity um, through it. Um, so it really changes the idea of what the blockchain is from the processor of every single transaction that needs to happen to, um, to just a judge that will um, decide on who is cheating. Um, and, but this is a judge that we know exactly what the judge will decide. This is a deterministic judge that by the validity of the signature, like this is just cryptography, you know what the judge is going to say. So if you know 100% that he's going to rule against you, there's very little incentive to cheat. So the game theory behind the system functioning um, without many channel closes, I think is very good. So that uh, analogy for the, the contract system is like, imagine you and I are in a business together and we, you know, you're in charge of uh, sales, for instance, and I'm in charge of, uh, or you're in charge of international sales and I'm in charge of domestic sales. And every day we need to go to the bank and deposit the money we made, the revenue. We can go to the bank every time, and that's going to be painful and laborious, and we need to go on the same time, and we need to make sure the bank's open, we need to pay big bank fees. <coughs> we decide, hey, you know what? We can create a contract, like a written contract, where we say, if one of us goes and tries to go to the bank and maliciously deposit those funds, then the other one is legally able to pull double the amount or some agreement you make. And now, instead of going to the bank every time, we just settle the money up together and store it somewhere easy where we can always meet. So then the, the bank, or whoever manages that contract, 
rather than now processing the transactions, is just waiting for us to come and say, oh, that person, my partner, tried to cheat me. But because the contract is, the, the repercussions for breaking the contract are so steep, there's no, need, there's no reason to. So it kind of self-enforces it, just as an analogy into the regular contract world. Because when people hear smart contracts, I think they immediately think like Ethereum and uh, I don't even know what they think. There's so many things you can think. It's not really even well defined, but uh, that's what we mean by contract. Digital cryptographic contract uh, meant to ensure some protocol between people who may not trust each other. Yeah. Uh, stop me if you're going to get to it, but do they have to put? Do they have to stake what they would pay as a penalty or anything like that? Um, kind of. Yeah, they fund it. We'll we'll talk about it in a bit, but they fund it initially, and then they could lose it all. And so this is uh, this can be asymmetric yeah. too. Then. Say that again. The amount that you're going to stake in, that each party stakes into the uh, into the contract, it's not. It doesn't have to be symmetric. Exactly. Right. Yep. It doesn't have to be. Um, yeah, so we kind of, we changed the mechanism of how we're thinking about these payments, but we also changed the trust model a little bit. Um, in current Bitcoin, if you give your address to somebody, um, you need to do nothing else to receive payments to that address. Um, and somebody can just uh, make payments to you. Uh, within the Lightning Network system, when you're managing channels, um, in order to keep your balance secure, you need to be connected and watching um, the blockchain for potential cheating. Um, and if you see the cheating, if he's attempting to um, settle the contract in an old state, in a broken state, in a state that in order to update, he provides the revocation or the other party provides the revocation. Um, and if you have that revocation and you see their transaction trying to cheat, you have the ability to um, take everything from that. Um, so you still need to watch the blockchain, but you don't necessarily need to fully validate everything. So in the same way um, that light clients or phone wallets um, today function um, without downloading the entire blockchain, without verifying every single transaction, um, they still operate in a way that is fairly trustless. And um, if you were at the product devs thing um, last time, I talked about how the bloom filters work and about how Merkle trees work. And that is the mechanism, or those two things are the mechanism that allow the current day light clients um, to operate with the network in a way that is quite trustless. They connect to many different nodes. Um, and ask for the headers from all of those nodes. Um, and they, they can compare the headers and use that, like, the very quintessential thing about how this thing works is that you can verify how much work was put into these headers. And by verifying how much work is put in these headers, you can very confidently verify that it's not fake headers being given to you because they are just so difficult and so impossible to come up with that Millions of computers are trying all the time to make these things and are unable to. Uh, so, in order for um, like we we need to move forward. Like in order to move forward with lightning, uh, it needs to be possible for um, the light clients to interact with the network, um, and it needs to be possible to manage these channels without um, validating everything. Um, so they've proposed, and I can't go into too much detail because I'm not sure how much I actually understand it. Um, but they've essentially reversed um, how light clients um, will operate um, and reversed who is sending the filter to who. So the full nodes um, will create these filters um, that if you input an address that is being used within that um, block or a transaction ID that's being used within that block, it will um, come out true and it will indicate to you that something in that block is interesting to you. Um, and then you can download the whole block from whatever source you want. Um, so you're on, you aren't um, sucked into this relationship that Bloom filters have, like the light nodes 
when they're asking a node to deliver its information, they pass this bloom filter, and depending on the specs of the bloom filter, um, a lot of information can be passed, like the bloom filter could match nearly everything, and it could be just a light node that's kind of dosing um, the node that's serving. Um, but it's like this very... Um, <laughs> He just explained it to me earlier, and I, I don't understand. He understands it way more than I do, but that makes sense that that's a problem with the existing bloom filters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you get into this um, kind of dependent relationship between um, the, the light nodes that are being fed um, information by the full nodes, and they are also the light clients are also weak to um, being not served data that did match their bloom filter. So the the nodes could just uh, maliciously not broadcast the transaction that met with the bloom filter that they sent them, um, just to mess with them. So there's kind of these um, not so great things what, happening with the current version of light clients. Um, and as we're moving towards lightning, there's kind of this move to move towards a different way of um, yeah, managing how light clients work with the Bitcoin network. And I think there's still a lot of work to go on this and a lot of um, upgrading to do get all the nodes serving this different information, but it, it really seems like a good way and it seems like the transition to Lightning and to managing the Lightning contracts is going to be a good time to transition to a new trust model for light clients too. So like the purpose of like the, the if I'm correct, so like the the, ba like the balance light, light clients are trying to walk is like having Repu like maintaining a structure that pulls reputable information and avoids scamming while still bearing the l lowest load of like resource consumption, yeah. et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. What the main privacy thing is like, what you don't want is for the network to know which transactions you're interested in. Yeah. Because if you know that information, then you can look up that transaction later and go, oh, well, node, uh, node A must have sent out or received funds in this transaction. And if you can do that, you can start to build up this graph of which transactions they control, and then you might be able to tell how much money they have, which is like, that's not a good system, right? How many times have people, this is a weird thing, how many times have people walked up to you and gone, how much Bitcoin do you own? No one wants to tell that. No. <laughs> how many times does anyone walk to you up and said, how much do you have in your bank? Hopefully zero, because it's really annoying and weird, and you don't want that information known. Is there a question over there? Or? No, no. Okay. Okay. Also, side note that uh, Taylor just made me realize. One thing I want to talk or quickly say is that Bitcoin. People get really excited about Bitcoin and the technology, and it's beautiful, and it just is amazing how it all came together. Lightning to me is like that, but at least two times, three times, four times. It's just like I'm sitting here reading about this stuff and. The way it all came together and just how it works out and the improvements they're able to do is the most amazing, I will say it, the most amazing technological thing I've ever seen. Like, it is just a joy to read about and the people are simultaneously super brilliant and like really fun and, and happy and regular people. And the community is really good. It's like the early days of Ethereum for anyone who remembers that. In the early days, like the, the, the still kind of is compared to Bitcoin, but there was a lot of good feels going around in Ethereum, and it, it feels like that right now with Lightning. And it's super justified. Is it the Bitcoin core team working on it? Um, there's a couple on the Bitcoin core team, like a man named Rusty Russell. Uh, but mostly it's this guy, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, Ulalu Unkantoken, I don't know. Uh, but Lightning Labs, and Dreja, and Joseph Boone. Yeah, there, there's three, um, like, I think, working implementations of Lightning, um, none of them being head up by the Cordev specifically. Like, Rusty Russell is part of Blockchain. I don't know how much she's... So they're all proposals? Or they... No, no, it's, it's working oh, okay. yeah. Uh, on testing. Yeah, there's a C implementation, a Golang implementation, and then what's the other one? Um, Scala. Scala. Ah. So Java is the wallet. Yeah. Um, and they just got to the point where they're all interoperable with each other. So that was kind of the prerequisite before actually hitting mainnet. So I think very soon we're going to see this thing start to go live. Um, 
One thing I would just like to mention, and this is just kind of another thing um, about the trust model. So it, it's not really good um, if your computer goes offline, if you haven't lost your keys, but maybe, I don't know, your house burned down or some, some disaster happened and you just have gone offline and you're gone offline for longer than the duration of the contract. Um, in, in theory, if the person who is connected to you sees that you went offline, um, he could attempt um, a malicious closing of the channel. So closing an earlier state that um, takes some of the money that he would have sent you back. Um, but the Lightning system has been set up that you will be able to essentially contract out to third parties um, the watching of the closing of your channels and the enforcement of your contracts. And none of your private information is exposed unless there's an attempted malicious spend. Um, so it, that also just really um, pushes the game theory one farther out because not only do you have to think as an attacker that the node you're connected to is offline, you have to think that every single third party that might just, out of the good of its heart, enforce the contract, like it's kind of a benevolent thing to do, but as long as one thing is honestly doing that, honestly processing and trying to just saying, okay, that's trying to cheat and I'm gonna prevent it from cheating, um, then you won't be able to. So just one benevolent actor can secure the entire system. And I think it's very likely that there will be more than one benevolent actor. And that should be super amazing to you because that's like, that's like if you have a house cleaner and he or she goes into your house and cleans your house, but you also have cryptographic proof that they didn't steal anything or take anything. It's, it's like how, it seems so much like you can't relax on some of these assumptions that like they would be able to view certain things about your transactions and your balance, but they don't because of the really smart people who are implementing it. And they're putting a lot of thought into it. Yep. It seems that working around cheating is a crucial part in Lightning Network. Yes, it's about like 80 to 90% of the work. That's, that. that's great, but I fail to understand or so yeah, I have to comprehend what kind of cheating are we fighting? Like, can you give me an example of cheating between two parties? Yeah, sure. Um, so let's say, how do I condense this? Let's say we're doing that example before where uh, we're not like going to the bank anymore, we're writing down our tallies of, of what we've done. Um, and it's, so it's a, it's a little hard to explain because the way Bitcoin works is like, it's not like you can just like have a running tally of what the total is, erase the existing one and then write a new one. It's more like um, every new update, you uh, create like a new balance. And just think of it as like a piece of, or number on a piece of paper. And then the next day you have another piece of paper that is the new balance. So like first we have $8 and $8, and then we have $7 and $9. And then uh, it goes to $6 and I'm doing the math right, $10 there. So what's to stop you from taking one of those earlier numbers where you have a higher balance, for example, and bringing it to the judge and going, here, look, this is my balance. For instance, you start out with eight and eight, and let's say I'm like selling crypto kitties to you, I'm selling some service to you, and uh, you give me all your funds, so I have 16 and you have zero now. And then you go to the judge and say, hey, look, I have eight, because you have a piece of paper which at one point says you have eight, eight dollars. And okay. you need a way to like make those previous states, the previous <coughs> balance states, be invalid. So in Bitcoin before Lightning Network, there was no such thing as a balance, it's just the sum of outputs. Yes. Right? Yes. So you're saying that in Lightning Network there's actually a field that contains a balance and that can be somehow changed? Uh, the state, we'll look into this, but the state is represented by something called a commitment transaction. It's a transaction that has outputs. And um, you, when you want to update the state, you create a new transaction. Okay. So both these transactions are valid right now. And if you keep doing that, it's the same example where like you would have zero and then I would have 16. But what happens when you just go and broadcast that original transaction to the network? You know, that sucks. I've been cheated. 
So you need a way to prevent that sort of cheating, or you need a way to totally disincentivize it to the point where it would make no sense to broadcast that original transaction. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, so next, next, next time I'll do away with the analogy and just say the straight transactions. And we'll look at that in much more detail soon. Okay, um, so just take a second to talk a little bit about what these parent channels actually are. Um, <laughs> so the payment channels are a two of two uh, Bitcoin address that is being managed between you and the node you're connected to. Um, and they're a two of two address or a funding transaction is kind of the root of it. And every um, transaction that is exchanged between the two nodes is spending that two of two um, that was originally locked up between the two parties. So all of the transactions that are built off of the funding transaction are spending the um, inputs of this original funding transaction. Um, and before the parties are um, willing to send the money into the original funding contract, or they're willing to fund this contract, um, they need um, kind of the insurance that they're going to be able to get their money out of it. So before they fund um, the original funding transaction, they exchange these transactions that are spending the inputs of this funding transaction that hasn't yet been included in the, in the blockchain yet. Um, and the reason they can do that is SegWit, and the reason um, Lightning was really needing SegWit um, is because we can know the transaction ID of that funding address, therefore we can uh, make transactions spending it um, before it is even included in the blockchain. Um, so each party in the channel has its own version of these payment channel transactions. So the transactions that I'm holding are different than the transactions of the person um, I'm connected to. Um, but they're a mirror of each other, essentially. Um, and the two mechanisms that are used um, are time locking, um, an opcode in the Bitcoin scripting language called check sequence verify, um, prevents an input or an output from being spent for a certain amount of time. And that preventing of spending or that locking is what gives the time for the cheating uh, or the, it gives us time to go to the judge. So all of the payments that are paying out to yourself, if you're closing the channel in an unfriendly way, um, have to be locked. And going to the judge just means broadcasting a transaction to the blockchain. Yeah. Broadcasting a transaction which will uh, harm the other the harm the other channel member who tried to attack you by uh, broadcasting an old state or cheating in some way. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? Um. Yeah. Seg Segway was important here because you can see the chaining going on. Uh, that's why we fought for two years to get chaining, just so that or just SegWit, so that we could do this chaining. And I'm going to show you a further image later on that's like this, but multiplied by four. And uh, there's a lot of chaining going on of transactions that spend from previous transactions. Um, and this part is really, really complex. And honestly, neither of us have like fully grasped it all. Grasped it all. Um, but this is what on a low level a lightning network looks like, is chaining of transactions where the outputs of those transactions represent various pathways that the channel members can take based on whether the opponent, the channel, other channel member is cheating, whether someone wants to update the state in some way. Yeah. So, so assuming no cheating, yep. this sort of off blockchain or off the main Bitcoin blockchain set of transactions can only use the maximum of the funding that's there. You know, you, let's say you take eight, 800 Bitcoin, yep. you could only transact back to forward all those 800 Bitcoin. Yes. If you need to do a thousand, you'd have to go back to the blockchain and start again. Yeah, you would have to yeah. open another channel. Yeah. Or if, yeah. Do you Huge know payments you don't really make too much sense online. 
Yeah, yeah. If you're going to send it 800 big. Bitcoin, you I might as well just send, send a regular transaction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So an interesting thing I learned from the Lightning Dev Slack channel, which anyone can join, is that right now the largest, the fattest a channel can be is 0 0.042 Bitcoin. So it's a little less than a thousand dollars. So it's not like uh, like Coinbase can just move their entire funds into this Lightning Network channel and start moving everything trustlessly. It's really small right now. And this is actually like at first you're like, man, I, I got so excited in 2015. You're going to tell me I can move everything off chain, but it's not like that. And they're taking it very slow, and they don't give any dates. They don't give any dates, like the, the Lightning developers. I've heard of no dates when like this next iteration is going to be complete. And that's, if you're a developer, you can probably appreciate that that's super nice. You just focus on making the best tech you can. And it's not great in the short term, but in the long term, it's going to make it really, really good. Battle tested and uh, usable. Okay. So, uh, now I want to talk about, so, so that's like existing problems that people who are familiar with Bitcoin will know are problems and we can solve and we'll fix them right now. The things that we can't do right now, that we can now do with Lightning, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, right now. And um, there's three things and this is what I'm most excited about is like right now Bitcoin is a crappier version of PayPal and fiat. It's trustless, which is unique, but it's just a crappier version of PayPal. But the things that Lightning gives us are truly new. Never before have they been able, uh, we've been able to do them. And that's really exciting. That's what new technology should do, is enable new, new actions, new communications. So one of the things, and I spoke about this earlier, are the instant payments. If you've ever waited two months for a transaction to go through or tried to buy something in person, it's really annoying. And now you can send it as fast as you push electrons through a wire. So that's really, really good. That's actually what a currency is meant to be, or a, a form of payment is meant to be. Another big one is micropayments. So um, right now, the smallest that you can, the smallest divisible unit of a Bitcoin is called a Satoshi. And it's 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. So it's still sub cent layers, but um, maybe we want to go smaller. And, and really, like, no one sends a Satoshi from one person to another. This is something called the dust limit, and I think it's like 2,730 dust or some, something in that range where you can't actually create an output that's that small. So with Lightning, the base unit is called a milli Satoshi. So it's a thousandth of a Satoshi. It's one ten billionth. Might be getting the orders of magnitude wrong there, but it's one ten billionth that you can send back and forth to each other as fast as you can push electrons through a wire. And you can get even, like a really cool idea I heard is something called probabilistic payments, where you can make it even smaller. And the basic idea behind it, it's so, it's so, like, it's so cool. Um, so we're sending back and forth. And we don't actually send one Satoshi back and forth. We send back uh, an output which says, if this coin flip, or, or if this roll of a dice, the 10-sided dice, if it comes up as a 10, then I pay you. And the other nine times, I don't pay you. So it's called probabilistic payments, because if I send you a million payments, where 10% of the time it should actually pay you, that means that I only actually send you uh, what hundred thousand dollars, but I could still push these smaller amounts to you and make it so that we can accept even smaller amounts. So why do we care about micropayments? Like some apps that you may make are. Uh, does anyone know Brave here? Brave the browser. What what are they trying to do? What's their goal? Yeah, ad blocking. And they pay you for the ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They made basic accounting token, um, basic a basic attention token. Uh, and the thing that attracted me to them was that you can pay publishers in Bitcoin. Like, how how does it how is 
funding work on the internet right now? It's subscription based, or they give you ads and then steal your information and take your eyes, right? Here's a third model. Actually, just pay the people for watching it. You could pay by line. Imagine there's a little algorithm in your browser which every time you scroll, it calculates what a line worth of text is, and then you pay a millisatoshi for doing that. And maybe that doesn't work for a lot of things. <coughs> free internet and free content on the internet is pretty cool. But maybe there's these whole other niches of content and software which are now enabled when you have people paying in the millisatoshis. So you could do something like that. A cool idea I think of is like you have a bunch, you have a community that's all generating power through their own like PV cell, and you have basically a market of solar energy where some people have a little bit more, some people have better batteries, and you're sitting there and you go, who do I sell my extra energy to? And you need some way to mediate that market of energy, and so you could use something like micropayments to pay by the uh, what is it, milliwatt or whatever small amount. So the cool, the cool and weird thing about micropayments, I feel like, is like it's kind of hard to explain what's cool about them because we just literally don't know. Who in 1993 was talking about AWS and CryptoKitties and Bitcoin? No one was. This is the really, for me, really frustrating thing is like, I, this is just sort of a side rant, but relevant to micropayments. Like, I feel like I'm sitting there on the edge thinking, what are all the new things that are going to happen? What is, what is going to be built with this technology? I don't even know. It's super frustrating. But I know it's going to be amazing and probably nothing like I'm expecting. So uh, micropayments are a part of that. And then the last thing are this cool sounding idea of cross-chain atomic swaps. And this actually happened last week, not too long ago, with Lightning. But the idea is that you can have two blockchains, for instance, Lightning and Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin and Bitcoin, which implement the Lightning protocol. And you can route, if, if I have 100 Litecoin and he has 100 or 1 Bitcoin, we can create a set of transactions where I end up with the 100 Litecoin and then he has my 100 Bitcoin. So you can do things like decentralized exchanges but cross-chain which is amazing to me because I think of every blockchain as its own little oasis and it knows nothing about the other nodes, but suddenly now you can make payments across them. That's really cool. Which opens up these whole like arbitrage, arbitrage possibilities and I may lose my job because a lot of my customers, my companies are exchanges, but it's going to be really fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Take a little break. <laughs> a lot of information just fire hosing at you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the atomic swap with Lightning and Bitcoin. Yeah. To increase how fast and reduce the, the cost. With Litecoin right now, it's a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper. Will Lightning also make that similarly more faster and more cheaper uh, if Lightning is added to Litecoin as well? Uh, it is added right now. Actually, Litecoin added Lightning before Bitcoin did. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when you mean faster, do you mean the actual swaps or do you mean like a regular paying? I, don't, I think that will still be capped at whatever speed like does it at, which is still unknown. I was trying to find like how what is the upper limit of light, uh, lightning, yeah, and there isn't really any clear idea. The theoretical limit is pushing electrons through a wire, but um, it's definitely going to open up arbitrage opportunities where like if lightning is slightly worth, well, Litecoin is slightly worth more, then it's just trivial to send Bitcoin to exchange your Bitcoin for lightning. And it's going to slightly decrease the volatility, I would say, of the various coins because anytime there's a slight discrepancy, they'll be closed by someone who just wants to make the money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Let's just talk about like putting your so people have different channels open, main channels, and like 
they're only settled at a later date. So why can't you access two of the same money? Like if you're not monitoring every other channel, how do you know if it's not on chain until later that you haven't already started the contract over here at this channel on this channel? Uh, because the, the funding transactions would be like you need you need a valid Bitcoin transaction to open the so you need channel. Like fund it on chain. Yeah, it's two, yeah. two on chain, that's the start of the channel. Um, so I thought this might be a good time to do the Starbucks demo. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the um, the light client implementation of Lightning is called the Claire, um, and it's on Android. Um, and I have put some testnet coins on here and opened a few channels. Um, and I would like to buy some coffee because that's what you want to do with money, right? <laughs> Uh, so we can see how fast it is to operate here. I would like one of each. Um, did it works. I did just do this before, and it did work. Um, so the QR code that will eventually display here. Um, is different than the regular Bitcoin QR code. Um, it is uh, broadcasting to the um, to my client uh, the routing information that will allow this client to find a route um, to this website, um, and then it's also broadcasting the secret information um, that could be used to. Um, Um, that can be used to update every step along the way of the line channel. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and within this wallet, um, I have opened up payment channels. Um, so everything should be good to go if we can get. There we go. Hold that. Reload it. Do I need to press some? Uh, yeah, so pick one of the espressos. Add the cart? Yeah. And then check out. Cool. Okay, so this um, contains that routing information. Um, and I can scan. And it, it really is amazingly fast. Oh. <laughs> hey, there we go. And there it is. So, because all that really needed to happen, it's, I think it's very likely that the automatic channel that was opened was opened directly with um, the Starblock site. So it's likely it's only a few hops away. Um, but we could see that it was basically instant. Um, and because if it was just my channel to their channel or my channel to a couple of channels in between, only like once the transactions have been exchanged between all of the parties, it, it's final. It's done. Um, so you can have this irreversible thing that settles um, instantly. Like you could see there was hardly even a noticeable difference between when I clicked on my phone to when this went. Um, and that's the type of user, user experience that is game changing. Yeah. That was freaking cool. I haven't seen that. What about, sorry. So what happened here is that um, this Starblocks node opened the channel and you... No, I had previously opened channels on my wallet. With uh, someone? So, with so I, I'm not sure who, it's likely someone close to these guys because the, the group of developers who are building this, it's a pretty small graph at this point. Um, but in, um, so I think there'll be this new version of Bitcoin wallets that um, it's telling me I have Bitcoin, and it's telling me that I have Lightning Bitcoin. And that Lightning Bitcoin is the Bitcoin that's tied up in a payment channel. And that Lightning Bitcoin is the one that can be spent instantly. And once you've opened up channels, then you can um, spend. So uh, what, what has actually happened is my channel here has um, had its balance updated so that um, I, in my channel with the person that I opened up or the node that I connected to, is now um, 
that if you, we were to settle it now, more of the Bitcoin would go to him. Um, and on their side, whoever was connected on the other side, like it, its payment channel has been updated. But we don't need to go to the blockchain again because all of these um, balance updates are on the two of two um, funding transactions that were originally brought in when we entered this network. So there was a channel open and you have joined it previously mm -hmm. and you made this payment from your lightning balance. Yeah. Will you need to settle on the on the chain at some point? Theoretically no. So assuming <laughs> there are no uh, malicious people in the network, then no. You don't need to. Well, you would need to settle up when your channel runs dry. Like let's say I pushed all the funds to you and like I don't have any more funds to push, but I want to keep buying energy on the energy market, we would have to go, all right, let's close this channel and create a new channel and maybe we'll double the initial funding since now uh, I see that I want to keep paying you. I'm not, it's not clear to me, I don't see any reason why, for instance, if we created a channel, why we couldn't agree to like fund the same channel between us, yeah. whether that, is a new one or whether that's the same one or whether that's more efficient is I don't know but yeah you may like exhaust your channel so, yeah. so the, it's like moving money from a line of credit to a checking account basically and you draw down your checking account and then you have to keep refunding it yep right. yep just pipes move out yeah and one thing we probably should have made clearer before is like there's like you so so I have known Taylor for a couple months now and let's say uh, we've created a payment channel with each other. That is useless if I want to pay you, who I haven't met before. But maybe Taylor has met you before because he's been here longer than I have. Maybe you've seen each other. The beauty of the Lightning Network is that I don't need to clog the Bitcoin with the clog, clog the Bitcoin network uh, blockchain with creating a channel between us and creating a funding transaction between us. I can route my payment totally trustlessly through Taylor to you. And if you've heard about the like six degrees of separation thing where like you're connected via someone by six hops, that's amazing because it's probably less than six hops for people here because we're a pretty insular group. Uh, and those hops can be decreased and thus cheaper and we can route to pretty much anyone. So that's, that's one of the amazing things, is that you can route trustlessly with incredibly low fees. There is a Litecoin uh, network fee, but it's extremely low. Um, and you can do that trustlessly. Do you mean Litecoin? Uh, sorry, I mean Lightning. Wow, I've probably like, mis said that so many <laughs> times now, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what's, what are, what's the exact info that's encoded in the QR code? With yeah. to the routing of Let's go into that after because we've already been going in about an hour and we're going to go even deeper and go into look into the JSON output and whatnot. But uh, most people aren't developers here, so I don't know if I really want to go into that. All right. We should do that after. You okay. should come up and I can show you everything. Sure. Yep. So uh, uh, my question is what happens to the transaction fee? So you just said that there is a, there's probably a lighting. Uh, transaction fee. But for example, if I have j just a one-time transaction with somebody, yes. um, should I pay the same transaction fee that I would pay when I'm doing a Bitcoin transaction with them? Depends if you close on the Bitcoin network or not. If you close on the Bitcoin network, you'll always have to pay a fee, like a regular fee. Um, and to do a route, like to hop through the Lightning Network, you'll have to pay the small little milli Satoshi fee. But the real big question, and if you're concerned about fees, is how often do I push to the main chain? Because mm -hmm. that's where it's going to hurt you. Yeah. So, for example, if somebody I, I'm paying somebody and that person wants to use the money I sent them, then I'm going to pay the transaction fee. Then, then I'm what do you mean by use? You can use this on the, the Lightning Network. Oh, okay. So, so I can use the money I received in the Lightning Network for, for another... Yeah, as long as the person who you want to send to also has a Lightning has a connection. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the, the payment layer of Bitcoin will be Lightning. Right? Mm -hmm. Paying yeah. someone in Bitcoin in the future, like, very few people will make on-chain transactions. Like, that was kind of an early adopter phase. 
like to for the scaling, like for this to actually go to a large transaction throughput. Most users of Bitcoin will just be channel operators. They'll just be the, in the smart contract, but they'll be building on the trust that Bitcoin already has, and they'll still have the same uh, guarantees that Bitcoin has today. One one useful analogy. I love analogies, as you can tell. But uh, do you know what BGP and TCP IP are? Uh, the the connection protocols. Low level protocols, yeah. which I am amazed if anyone here understands how those actually work. But now everyone uses the layer on top, which is HTTP. And a fair number of people know how that work, how that works. And it's sort of the similarity there is like the Bitcoin is this low level TCP BGP stuff, which we don't need to worry about anymore. And everyone's using this faster, more abstract, easier to use top layer. And one more question. Uh, this is the last one. Uh, who is paying the transaction? If if I want to, for example, push my the money I got in the Lightning Network to the blockchain, who is paying this transaction fee? Good Am question. I yeah. Um, Do you know? I remember it's one. So, of them. It, no, it, it isn't. There's a negotiation step. Actually, the the peer to peer protocol or the protocol setup part, where it gets most convoluted, is in the negotiation of the. But all of that is decided when you're originally signing these transactions. Because when you're updating the state of the channel, you are uh, exchanging um, valid Bitcoin transactions with valid Bitcoin signatures that are broadcastable. And part of that being broadcastable is how much fee they have. Um, so that's really negotiated in the process with the, um, the contract opening. And it's just, um, I think it, it's safe to say that you can um, you can keep a fairly decent fee in there because you're not expecting to pay it, maybe, maybe ever, just the point you want to close. All right, one more question and then we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, you, no worries. Yeah, uh, when you say like you can route through another user of the Lightning Network, yeah. like what does it mean to route through another person? And I guess I'd like to add on to that, like this fee that you pay for the Lightning Network, like, who does that go to? What is that for? That goes to the person who you route through. So, uh, like in the example, sorry, what's your name? Ramon. Ramon. So I want to pay Ramon, but I'm going through Taylor. I, I think me the sender, because that would make the most sense. Uh, I'm going to pay, like, I want to pay one Bitcoin, or I guess much less than that, point, point one Bitcoin to Ramon. Uh, it's actually going to be 1.0000000001 because that 001 is going to Taylor. Right. And, it, and, and I will be receiving, so one of my channels will increase by 0.1 and the other will in, it decrease by 0.1. And I just require a little difference to bother doing it. But he could have several channels open and when he's thinking about building that route, he is minimizing fees. So if I ask for too much fee, I would just be routed around. So I think there's kind of very good, again, it's just like there's so many places in this that I see just good game theory mechanics that are going to lead to good results. Yeah. Did and there's, there's well-known algorithms for pushing information through pipes, like Ford, Ford Fulkerson. Yeah. Anyone know it? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we know how to do that in very fast. Does that mean like your client is constantly like running and connecting to the network so it's open yes. for routing? Yes, yes, but you can push, I'm not sure if it's all of it out, but you can push a lot of that processing and you, you can certainly push the watching for like malicious behavior to a third party who will then know nothing about you, but they'll know enough to like alert you, hey, this person's trying to screw you over. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry, we're going to keep going, but I... I will be here till like 3 a.m. if people want to <laughs> talk, because so much fun, guys. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> so, we've tangented so much that we have to answer this question, <laughs> but uh, we're just going to keep going. So, what is lightning? Um, the way I like to think of it is that it's IOUs on the blockchain, where we could do, this is the example again with the business and not going to the bank, but just settling up with IOUs between us. We could push, oh, I'm sorry, as background, whenever you explain things in cryptocurrency world, cryptography world, you use these uh, 
Alice and Bob figures, and there are others who may make an appearance. <laughs> but uh, so if Alice and Bob are transacting with each other, they're pushing all these transactions to the chain, and it's horrible because they need to wait for 10 minutes for confirmation, they need to pay high fees, the blockchain can only hold one megabyte's worth of transactions per block. So it's kind of lame, but what Lightning does is it's two people who don't trust each other coming together and saying, we're going to create a channel of communication between us. We're going to exchange these secure, trustless IOUs with each other. And all that the blockchain will need to see is the initial funding transaction, which you do have to wait 10 minutes for, for it to get confirmed. Uh, when I say 10 minutes, it's like on average 10 minutes, because it's not like a block is mined every 10 minutes exactly. But on average, it's 10 minutes. And if you wanted to settle up to the blockchain for some reason, uh, you would need to broadcast another transaction, which is the closing transaction. Yeah. So from an algorithm perspective, it's super awesome because it takes something that's O of N. You want to push N transactions uh, to a blockchain, and it makes it O of 1, constant number 2. OK. So again, who, how many people here have run their own full node? OK. Y'all should come up to me after, because we've already gone like over the 45 minutes or whatever that I wanted to speak of, uh, or speak about. But um, I will show you the actual commands that you enter into uh, LND, which is the main software written in Go. Uh, that speaks the Lightning Protocol and the LN CLI, which is a command line interface for sending JSON RPC requests to LND. Uh, we can go through this and I'll show you all the commands you enter. And we can do a demo after as well. <coughs> I think not many people would find it interesting. Who here loves looking at command line X output? God, you guys are <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, well, we just had a break. But, um, yeah. Well, I don't know. Let's, let's do a poll here. Who, so, okay, what do we got next? So, after this, we're going to dive into, like, Bitcoin scripting smart contracts and what these HTLCs and outputs actually look like on, like, a very low level. Or I can go and talk about the uh, kind of higher level, how do I interact with light, uh, light LND and LNCLI, and like how do I actually create a payment channel and what does that look like? Let's just do a show of hands. Who would rather see the Bitcoin scripting? And I can talk about this later, but it's more like while I monopolize your time in front of you, uh, which one do we want to prioritize? One question though, which one is harder to find online? Well, I've given you all the references that I use to learn this stuff. So, secret, dirty secret, I learned pretty much all of this in the last three weeks. So, uh, you can do all this as well. So, um, the resources are all there. But what stuff is harder to learn? Certainly the Bitcoin scripting stuff. That's the, that's the more like, whoa, it actually works like that. So, let's do that. Okay, well, we'll let everyone decide, because, will everyone bring their ASIC miners? We can just do like a consensus. <laughs> Lame blockchain joke. Okay, so who wants to do the, um, let's look at JSON RPC, uh, how do I actually use LND as a developer? Ruby? And who wants to do the, how does Bitcoin smart contracting work? What is the theory? And how many people just don't care or just want to go with the flow? Okay, so it looks like we're going to do Bitcoin smart contract and stuff. We can do the other thing tomorrow at Ventro Labs. We're doing that. Yeah, we're, Lightning we're kind of revisited tomorrow. We're getting the go clients going here, and if people want to be around and figure out how this works, um, anytime's a good time. Yeah, like we were hoping this would be the first meetup to uh, help anchor Vancouver as like a educated test net for Lightning being rolled out. Like that we'll all become literate enough in this that we could push GitHub issues, etc. once there is like a beta out. 
So yes. it's going to oh. keep rolling. The fund's and, going to keep rolling. And if you're looking to like get into the blockchain space, straight up the best time to do it, like uh, in a developer role, straight up the best time to do it is, I think, with this Lightning Network. Because like I've always been sitting on the side like, man, I want to be a core developer. Man, C++ is really scary. I don't want to learn that. And it just doesn't seem that welcoming. But the I've joined the LND Slack, and like you can just you can do it. You can learn Go, and you can push like fundamental updates to the protocol because it's still very early. Um, yeah. So I hinted before that we're going to see like a crazy chaining structure, and this is what one step of the Lightning Network protocol looks like. So we got our funding transaction here, and this is a two of two multi-sig address, which I'll talk about in a bit. And we have these commitment transactions, and the commitment transactions are basically saying, um, this is currently what everyone owes, and it's represented by the outputs that are in the transaction. So the outputs are like uh, representing how much people owe. And the commitment transaction exists to represent the current state of what the channel balances are for Alice and Bob, and also hold the uh, outputs that can be brought to the, or the outputs that pay to a person if the opposite channel member tries to do something dishonest or malicious. So, like like I said before, with the like eighty to ninety percent of the complexity is just is. Making it so you can recover your coin if someone does something bad. If we didn't have to worry about people being dishonest, we would have made this back in 2012. It would have been super simple. But um, actually, maybe not even then because it would have required other opcodes. But um, a lot of the complexity is this uh, preventing malicious behavior. So, how well can people see this? No. None? Okay. Mm, all right, screw this. Not through this one. Okay. So we won't get to, or I don't have slides for all of these, but maybe we can write some whiteboard stuff. But the, the coolest thing I, I want to talk about, and like this is so fun to teach people because it's just like one of these moments where the way you thought Bitcoin worked is not actually how it works, and the way it actually works is far more complex and super interesting. Uh, so I want to talk about smart contracts and how you can write, uh, you can use Bitcoin's built-in programming language, which is called Script, to do a lot of this interesting lightning stuff. Talk about multi-signature wallets, which is near and dear to my heart because my company uses multi-signature wallets to write wallet software and write a secure way for people to store and send their Bitcoin. Talk about how that relates to the funding and commitment transactions. And then maybe we'll get to time lock transactions and the rest of this stuff, but like that's getting into the area where I don't really know how it works. So I may just be giving you garbage information, but maybe we can learn together. Okay, so smart contracts. What is a smart contract? Just interested in what another person thinks. Does anyone know what a smart contract? Has anyone heard that word before? Phrase. Okay. Does anyone want to venture just what that means? Yeah, it's a line on the uh, in the blockchain. Well, it's a transaction on the blockchain that is that you can code on them, that you can call functions on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That that makes that sounds very Ethereum to me yes. because Ethereum is like meant for smart contract creation. Gives you a nice Java-like programming language to write those programs in. Or try a different approach. It's a self-executing contract. Self-executing. What's self-executing mean? If the conditions are met with whatever transactions, it will take place. That's that phrase or that description right there is closer to what we're talking about with smart contracts on the uh, Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. Not to say you're wrong with smart contracts. Honestly, I ask because like it's a really amorphous term that probably people. It's it's like more of a marketing term, I think. Even okay. though Adam Back uh, made it, or I think Adam Back made it. Um, but yeah, these smart contracts that we're going to use in Bitcoin are uh, lines of code which will be executed given certain conditions, and we're going to write these smart contracts to ensure that we can trustlessly send funds to each other on the Lightning Network. And I think the best way to get 
your toes wet with what script is. Uh, so script is the name of the programming language that Bitcoin uses. Uh, it's a stack-based programming language, so probably different than any language anyone has ever used before. There's a bunch of opcodes. So does anyone, like who here has looked at or heard of assembly language before? So imagine assembly where you have the very low level, like, like add eight bytes here, push into EAX register. You have low level opcodes like that. And the way they're executed is rather than thinking about it in like a Turing machine way where you have like, here's a reader and there's a new, a new opcode and it executes it and then a new one comes in and it executes it. You have a line of, you have a program like this, and you have a stack, which is like, uh, what? Not first in, first out. Philo, first in, last out. And you push op codes onto the stack, and then once there are no more code, no more op codes, you pull them off and execute them. And it ends up being really confusing because it's like things get executed in the opposite order. Um, but the cool things about uh, a language like this is that it's very simple to statically analyze, which is really what you want in a blockchain. One of the prime arguments why, one of the main arguments why Ethereum is just so doomed, which I don't know if it is, but like people say this, oh, yeah. is that like when turns out when you put a Turing complete language on the blockchain and you can't statically analyze it, crazy stuff happens and you have DAOs, asters, and uh, various failures. We're using that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Original sayer right there. Such a good term. <laughs> okay. So yeah, what I want to show you is um, how addresses actually work. So most people think of how Bitcoin addresses work is like you have Alice's address and you have Bob's address. And when you want to send from Alice, when Alice wants to send to Bob, she takes that address and she says, all right, Bitcoin, I'm signing you, and I'm saying that you are now owned by this address, right? And that's totally valid because that's how normally we think of how transactions work. We think of, or I think of two bags, this is my wallet, and I take money out here and put it here. Or you take on spends here and you put them in here. That works for thinking about it 99% of the time, but when you really want to go in and write these low-level protocols, you need to understand how it actually works. And how it actually works is that addresses are encodings of script programs, Bitcoin programs, where when you send, for instance, Alice sends to Bob's address, what she's saying is Bob gives her an address, and that address says, Whoever can run me, whoever can execute me, and have me return true at the end, is the owner of the coins in this address. Okay? So you can kind of think it like if you're in JavaScript land, it's kind of like a callback. Right? You have this function, and it's just sitting there unexecuted, and then you pass it some arguments, and it executes, and if it returns true, then cool, you own the Bitcoin, and you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so the uh, two words to look up, and these are horrible names for what these actually do, but it's more of a legacy back in 2011, 2009, 2010. The names for these made more sense. They don't really make sense now. But, so an address is an encoding of something called a script pub key, which an example is right here. And this is the most common address form that you'll see on the Bitcoin blockchain. Every, everyone's seen an address that begins with a one, right? Yeah, uh, most addresses in Bitcoin have, really all addresses have either a one or a three in the beginning. Hmm. And the, if you've ever sent money to Coinbase, for instance, you'll have sent to an address that has a one at the beginning. And uh, that one beginning address is an example of one of these addresses uh, where the function or the callback or the little Bitcoin script is this guy right here. It's called script pub key. And then the argument, which you end up putting in the input in order to validate and run the callback to completion with a true, with, to have it return true, is called the script sig. 
So what is this saying right here? This is called a um, pay to pub key hash. Okay, pay to pub key hash. And what it's saying is that anyone who can produce a signature which can be validated by this public key and the public key is identified by the hash of the public key uh, is the owner of the Bitcoin. Okay, so this program is saying whatever's passed to me, take the top thing on the stack and duplicate it. Make a copy and put it on the stack. Then hash that thing and then take this hash and put it on the stack and then compare the output of this hash. This is what the op equal verify does. Compare the output of this hashing function to this hash here. And if they're equal, continue and check that the signature provided uh, is valid for the given pub key. All right? Who here had the, who made, does that make sense to anyone here? Cool. Let's go through. Let's go through an example. Up to the last part where you said the equal verify, so it's like the original hash, then the hash. Uh, yeah. It stacks the, the second hash, the public key hash, or whatever, and then the third one. What is the third one? Which op equal verify? The op equal verify is seeing if the output of this hash function mm -hmm. is equal to this hash right here. This this produces a hash. Mm -hmm. This is a hash, and this is basically equals equals. Or equals equals oh, equals okay. if you're in Node.js world, JavaScript world. Um, so just going through this example right here, um, when you s so when you make an input in Bitcoin land, you pretty much include um, the script pub key, and then you concatenate right before it the script sig, and you can think of this as arguments to a function, and this is the function. Yeah. So you're going to push these values onto the stack. So you have your pub key, and then, or sorry, you have your signature, sig, and on top of that, you have your pub key. Now you're going to run your function, and you say opdo, you execute opdo. So opdo gets pushed on top, and it gets pulled off, and it goes, all right, what do I do? I take the thing that's on top of the stack and copy it and put it on. So now we have the signature, the pub key, and then a copy of the pub key. And then we push op, once, op hash 160 on, and that says, when you pop it off and execute it, it says, look at the thing on top, take it off, hash it, and then put that hash on top. So you have a signature, a hash, and another hash. Oh, sorry, you have a signature, you have a signature and a hash. Then you pop this hash on. So you have a signature, a hash, which is the output of this guy, and this hash right here. And then you push this one on, you pop it off, and you say, all right, what do I do? Take the top two elements and see if they're equal. If that returns true, then continue. If it returns false, fail the script, and the transaction is invalid. So the purpose of this is to determine if you can't spend? Exactly. Okay. So it's just exactly. a very basic payment from one person to another. If you've used a Bitcoin wallet, you've used a script. Yeah, yeah. This is being done thousands of times every block. All like in your mind you can replace, oh, when I send from Alice to Bob, I'm sending to an address. You can replace that with, oh, when I send from Alice to Bob, I'm specifying that the only way Bob can recover these funds is if you can provide the proper inputs to this function. And only Bob gets to even try it. Or it's only worthwhile Bob trying this. Yeah, you can try it. I can try it. You okay. can try it, but you'll fail at... So there's actually two points you'll fail. One is uh, you won't know what this pub key... Well, will you know the pub key? You may know the pub key, but people don't normally give out their Bitcoin pub keys very often. If you're reusing addresses, you might, but you shouldn't do that. Uh, and then the one you will certainly fail at is creating the signature, because only the person with the private key corresponding to the pub key can create the signature. Right. Okay, so we're almost done. Now we have the signature still on the stack. It's just been chilling there, and we have this op, uh, or and, and we sorry, and we have a pub key. Um, we put op check op check sig on. That pops off and says. Okay, 
check the two things below me, public key and signature. Use the public key to verify the signature, and if it returns true, congratulations, you own the coin. Okay? So, so, yeah. so how does this stacking script uh, language facilitate that? It is the CPU that, that executes the software. If we didn't have script, but then... But why would it have to be stacking for it to be better? Huh? Why does it have to be stacking? Uh, like I said before, the stacking is nice because it's very simple. It doesn't seem simple from our perspective because we're not used to programming like this at all. But from like a... You can imagine a bunch of like programming language nerds sitting around and finding very, deriving various theorems about how these sorts of computers work. From a theoretical analysis standpoint, they're very easy to determine how they work, uh, what are the resource requirements of a given transaction. Um, that's all very simple and 